Welcome everybody to the spring series um, on modeling natural prosperity for the future. Uh, the complex interactions and outcomes that characterize the global climatic and ecological crises require sophisticated modeling, monitoring, and measurement across different temporal, spatial, and human scales, including governance and policy regimes. This series showcases uh, some cutting edge approaches to climatic and ecological modeling from a range of interdisciplinary perspectives and, and, uh, and from leading thinkers, both academic and otherwise. The series asks how diverse approaches may be integrated and actioned to generate effective policy responses and forms of natural prosperity. So today we're pleased to have uh, Julianne Strove um, with us. Uh, Julianne received a PhD in geography from the University of Colorado Boulder in 1996. Um, and, for, and she works on understanding uh, the Greenland uh, climate variability. Subsequently, she became a senior research scientist at the National Snow and Ice Data Center at the University of Colorado. <clears throat> uh, she's a professor at University College London, and more recently, uh, Canadia 150 chair at the University of Manitoba. Her Arctic research interests are wide ranging and include remote sensing of snow and ice, short and long-term sea ice forecasting, atmospheric sea ice interactions, impacts of climate change within and beyond the Arctic. And her work has been featured in numerous news reports and documentaries. And in 2020, she received the EGU Julia and Jonas Westman Medal uh, awarded in recognition of outstanding scientific contributions to the study of sea ice. So Julianne, take it away. Great. Well, thanks for, for having me. This is a, a great new venue for me to present in. So screen because I have to give a presentation. And let's see. Take a check. Yeah. So as uh, Bob mentioned, I'm I have been a professor at UCL and more recently I've been um, a Canada 150 research chair. And this is um, an effort by the Canadian government to bring international scientists to Canada to do research. Um, it's a seven year fixed chair, but it, what it's nice is it really allows you to build a pretty robust research program um, with equipment. And um, for me, because I'm a polar researcher, I like to be able to go to the Arctic and that's often very costly. And so it's been very nice to have more funds to go do the kinds of research that I, that I like to do. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna focus a lot on observations and some of the new stuff that we've recently been doing. Um, and then also I'll talk a bit about future projections. So obviously, of course, why, we care a lot about this is we know our planet is warming and we see always see these media headlines about how hot the planet is getting and I guess 2021 was now the 45th year in a row with warmer than normal global temperatures. Um, this is something we've been seeing every year and you know if you just look at the global temperatures combining both the land surface and the ocean surface we can tell that we've been warming for at least 100 years if not longer and you know the warming that we're experiencing now is, is certainly much greater than anything that we think happened in the 1940s when there was a bit of a warming period as well. And according to the US government, they recently said that 2021 tied for the sixth warmest year on record. So our, the planet is warming, but the thing is, and the reason why I got interested in the polar regions is that we knew that if, if the planet is gonna be warming, that we would expect to see changes happening probably first up in the polar regions. And this is because these regions tend to be covered by snow and ice. And so they reflect a lot of the sun's energy back out to space. And so, you know, they kind of act as our natural refrigerator for the planet, keeping the planet cooler than it otherwise may be. So if there was something unstable happening, we should see it up in places like the Arctic first. And the whole idea is, of course, you have these warmer air temperatures that are happening. You start to melt more snow and ice, which then results in warmer temperatures, which melts more snow and ice, and it just is this positive feedback loop. And so they're very sensitive regions, and this is why I did my PhD originally on Greenland, was to try to document, you know, are we seeing a manifestation of this already, this positive feedback effect happening, which we definitely are. Um, and this is also why when we talk about global warming, yeah, the planet is warming, but that warming in the Arctic right now is three times the global average. This is the latest report from um, 
the AMAP report that came out, which was saying that, because before we thought it was about two degrees, now it's actually um, three times uh, warmer than what it is for the planet as a whole. And you can also see that if you just look at a zonal mean average, this is the Arctic region where the temperatures are happening much larger than even that we see, for example, in the Antarctic. So this is our region of concern and all of this warming is really focused up here, up in the Northern regions. And it's really focused over the Arctic Ocean. And this really highlights that warming that we've been seeing is, is a lot of it is linked to the fact that we're losing the reflective Arctic Ocean sea ice cover. And that is feeding back to warm because you cannot form sea ice until the ocean releases all the heat that it's gained in the summertime. And so then you're gonna have this big feedback to the atmosphere. And of course, snow cover over land is also contributing to this as well. Um, so this is the reason I kind of went into studying the polar regions in part was to look at this, this feedback and see, you know, what is the evolution going to happen in this region. And then we have all, of course, these, these media reports about the Arctic death spiral. <laughs> so this is something we've uh, seen a lot. And there's a lot of gloom and doom at the moment about the Arctic region. Now, of course, how do we go about looking at Arctic change? I mean, the Arctic is a very big region. It's a it's, uh, difficult region. It's, it's, it's often frozen, but with snow and ice, it's quite cold. It's a very harsh environment to work in. This is a nice satellite image from a sensor from the US called the MODIS imagery. Um, it's a visible satellite image. And yeah, so this is, this is our region of interest. But of course, there's many different ways we can go about observing places like the Arctic. We can go in the field. Um, we can put up some stations and take measurements. We can work off of research vessels, um, which is quite nice to do. We can um, also start working with aircraft and drones. But it's been satellite there, working with satellites. And especially polar orbiting missions that are sort of found here in this level in the, in the atmosphere above the Earth. Because geostationary satellites will just look at one point all the time. This is like our weather communication satellites. But these polar orbiting satellites allow us to get multiple snapshots of the Arctic every day. And so we can get these really nice data records of uh, how Arctic the Arctic is changing as a whole. And that's something we can't do if you're just going out on a ship or you're doing um, aircraft or drone flights or just sitting at a research station. So. Satellite data has been my primary tool for monitoring Arctic change. And my primary tool within that has really been working with passive microwave. And there's a few different reasons for this, but I'll start with the first one is it is the longest data record we currently have for monitoring climate change really anywhere on the planet, but especially up in the polar regions, because since the late 1970s, there has been a successive series of, of sensors that have been launched mostly by the US, um, which is all the, the SIMR and the DMSP satellites. These are all defense meteorological program satellites that the US has launched. Then we started having a joint Japan US sensor and then some more US sensors. And at the moment we're kind of, the US program is ending. So now we're looking to Europe, for example, ESA to maybe continue these observations once some of these sensors, which are still operating when they die because they are past their nominal lifetime, which is a bit of a concern at the moment. And the European Space Agency will likely be launching a follow-on mission. But passive microwave is really great for working in the polar regions because it doesn't matter if the sun is up or not. So if it's polar night, you can still see the surface and also you can see through the clouds. And that is something that limits, of course, working with like visible satellite data or thermal infrared data because you cannot see the clouds. And this just gives you a kind of an idea about what wavelengths we're looking at because visible is obviously what our eyes see. Um, thermal infrared, people are often quite familiar with as well. And microwaves, we, you know, we think about a microwave oven. But so these are just much, much longer wavelengths. And so because of that, they have different properties and that's why they can penetrate through the clouds and see the surface. So this is very handy for, for polar regions in, in particular. Um, because it doesn't matter what's going on with the weather or if it's night. And for us, what we mostly do is then look at data coming from regions between 1 and 89 gigahertz. So that's the frequencies we're working with. And at those frequencies, basically the, the energy that you're sensing from your satellite 
Um, we call it a brightness temperature, and it's basically proportional to the physical temperature of the object that's being sensed and its emissivity, so its likelihood of emitting energy. And these energies are quite weak. They're, they're not that much energy being emitted at these wavelengths, but they have a very strong contrast between open ocean and ice, for example. So it's very easy for us to say whether or not there's ice there or if there's not ice there, because the, the contrast in the emissivity is quite large. And it also allows us to do things like detecting if there's even liquid water and snow. So you can look at um, when melt starts, for example, or when it ends. Those are the kinds of things we can do. So there's a lot of advantages to working with these kinds of data. The drawback, though, with these kinds of data is that you're limited to quite coarse spatial resolution. So typically we have about 12 and a half to 25 kilometers of a grid cell resolution that we get from these satellites. And this is in part because there is such little bit of energy being emitted at these long wavelengths. And so you need to build very big antennas to be able to capture that energy that, that's being emitted. And this is why you have such coarse spatial resolution. So that is the, the one drawback. But again, you can see the Arctic all the time. And so this is how we've been able to document, for example, how quickly the Arctic Ocean has been losing its sea ice cover. Um, this is maybe a familiar graphic to a lot of people. It's the um, summary of a total area of the Arctic Ocean covered by sea ice in the month of September over the satellite data record. And you, know, you can see there's a lot of variability from year to year, but there's a very strong negative trend. And, you know, in some ways you could kind of argue, well, we had this huge precipitous decline that really started in 2007, which took a lot of scientists by surprise because all of a sudden you lost 26% of the summer ice cover from the following year, which was a big um, change. We had a decline in 2012, and it's kind of been staying at what we may call a new normal right now. Um, it hasn't been dropping massively over the last decade. And spatially, it shows you you know, where the ice is now at the end of summer. This is from 2020, but the red, the pink line indicates where historically the ice had been um, at that time of year. So looking at like a 1981 to 2010 climatology record. And you can see, I mean, if you look now at what's going on in the Arctic Ocean, all the coasts of Alaska and Russia are now ice-free in the summer times. A lot of these shipping routes, like the Northern Sea Route is now open every summer. Sometimes, sometimes the Northwest Passage to Canada is also open and clear of ice, but basically large amounts of the Arctic Ocean are now ice-free in summer. Now, you can also use this data set to do the same thing over Greenland if you want. You can look at, again, because you have the strong sensitivity of the sensor to liquid water in the snowpack on like say the Greenland ice sheet, we can also map how extensive the melt is um, from year to year. So in another way I can show this as this is a total melt extent of the Greenland ice sheet um, every year. It's like its maximum extent. And again, there's a positive trend in that too. So we're seeing, we see the CS covers declining and the Greenland melt um, is increasing over time. And spatially you can see the number of days that the ice sheet has experienced melt and this was for 2021. So it gives you a sense of, you know, obviously the melt is confined along the, the margins of the ice sheet, but it also can reach up to higher elevations and it can reach all the way up to the summit of the ice sheet as well. We can also use this data, especially um, some of the data products that are coming out now are combining the microwave with visible data to make really long data records of snow cover extent. And so this is just from, this is a Rutgers um, Snow Lab website, which is quite handy. You can just make graphics quite easily from them. And this is showing the snow duration in um, springtime over the Northern Hemisphere from 1967 to present. And this is just a snapshot of where the snow is right now. Um, so again, these are the kinds of things we can do um, using faster microwave data. We can even look at it in terms of trying to monitor, you know, how is the frozen ground changing as well? Because obviously with the Arctic warming a lot, it's also started to impact the frozen ground surface. And it's a little bit less straightforward to retrieve, for example, the permafrost freeze and thaw states, but you can also see differences in the amount of energy being emitting depending on whether or not the ground is frozen or, or if you see thawing in the active layer. And so this has also been used as well to document how permafrost is changing. So it's a really great um, technique to monitor changes in snow and ice, basically anywhere on the planet, but 
Well, obviously, my work has been focused mostly in the Arctic. Now, it's, it's a great data set, and it, and it gives us 40 years, um, or more than 40 years now, of observation. So we can look at long-term climate change trends, and we can look at how it tells us about the role of anthropogenic forcing, for example, in these changes that we see. But it doesn't tell us about how much mass is changing. And of course, we're really interested in about the total mass of ice that's changing on the planet. Um, so scientists at UCL really helped to pioneer some of our first estimates of not just you know, the area of the Arctic Ocean covered by sea ice, but how thick that actual ice is. And that was really done by Seymour Laxon and then also Catherine, um, oh wait, I'm, I don't know, if I'm just forgetting Catherine's last name. Sorry about that. Wait, how can I forget it? Um, it will come to me. Um, these are two of my colleagues who, who died tragically um, within about three months of each other and unrelated incidents. But they were the, the people that really got this going. And because of their initial work, this is a really active area of research now. And this is something that I'm more recently getting into now. Working at UCL, I was in hired in part to, to keep this work going that they had started. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that because again, just like working with passive microwave, it just measures the amount of energy that's being emitted by the earth at microwave frequencies. If we think about radial altimetry, it actually sends microwave beams down to the earth and it measures the amount of time for that energy to return to the satellite. So that is basically just the reverse. Instead of like sensing anything emitted, you're sending energy down and you're measuring the return. And that could tell us a bit about how then thick the ice is, which would depend of course on where exactly that signature is coming from. So the idea, and at least with the work that early work that Seymour Laxon did, is you had a, a radar to free, um, so all the way through the snowpack, hit the interface between the snow and the ice, and then come back from there. And if you know that, and if you can make then um, references about, well, what is the, the distance from, they have to have a sort of a reference ellipsoid up to the ice surface height. You need to know the mean sea surface height of the ocean. You also need to know the local sea surface height anomaly. And if you do that, you can get what we call the ice freeboard, which is basically just the amount of ice that is above the waterline. That's not telling you, of course, how much ice is below the waterline. And then you can get a relationship between this reference ellipsoid height and the difference in the, the mean sea surface height and the sea surface height anomaly, which has to do with waves and tides and things like that. So if you get this freeboard estimate, which is what we call the ice freeboard, then you could convert that into a total ice thickness by assuming that the ice flow is actually in hydrostatic equilibrium with the ocean and you apply Archimedes principle. But what that means is that you have your freeboard height um, and then you need to know how much snow is on top of there. So you need to know the water density and the ice densities as well as the snow densities and the thickness of the snow to convert it actually to a sea ice thickness. So that is the, the, the tricky part. I mean, no matter what with satellite data, we're never measuring exactly what we want. We're measuring energy, but we need to then convert that into something meaningful. And so this is one way that we could try to get an estimate of how thick the sea ice is. Um, and I'm gonna talk about a couple of things. So one is a radar, which is what Seymour Laxon and Catherine had pioneered. And then we have laser altimetry, which is what our more recent NASA satellites are doing. So that is actually sending a pulse of light instead of radar energy. So this will be in the visible wavelengths hits the snow and comes back. That one we know for sure is coming from the top of the snow because vis um, visible light is not gonna really penetrate into the snowpack. It's gonna come from the surface. Radar is a bit more ambiguous and that is a bit of a challenge for us to do a really accurate job with this. And part of it is, is that we just don't really know where the energy comes from with um, radar altimetry. The assumption at KU band, which is centered around 13 gigahertz, was that it will go all the way through the snow and come back from the ice. And then there's another satellite. So this is Cryosat 2. This is Altica. This one has a higher frequency. So this one, it, it, people have assumed that it's gonna just come from the top of the snow surface. But the reality with this is, is that depending on what is going on in our snowpack, we, it could come from anywhere. So say you have an ice lens in your snowpack, then most likely this frequency will just start 
be reflected from this ice lens and it won't actually be coming from in here. If you have any moisture in the snowpack or any salt in the snowpack, that is gonna move that height that is coming from up further up into the snowpack. If you have glazing of like crust layers, things like that. So it's a real big challenge at the moment to better understand exactly where that energy is coming from. And the other big unknown that we have, and this has been a huge challenge for scientists at the moment, is we don't know how much snow is on top of the ice and we don't know the density of that snowpack. And there's several different approaches that scientists are using today to try to get a handle on snow depth, but they all give very different answers. And I'll just start with this. This was a climatology put together by Warren et al. in 1999, which was based on taking Russian drifting station data where scientists were on the stations and they'd go out and measure the snow and they'd measure the density of the snow. And this was a climatology based on data collected in the 1980s. But we know the Arctic Ocean is very different than that today. Um, another climatology based on the same data, but trying to incorporate a few more data from um, planes that were landing on the sea ice, they tried to extend this a little bit, but they have quite deep snow. And it's unlikely in today's Arctic where we have a lot less sea ice, um, we have more open water, so it takes a lot longer for the ocean to refreeze, uh, that these would be a valid estimate of what the snow is like. People have tried to do different satellite-based techniques, um, taking differences of say two radar altimeters, like Ka and Ku band to get a, um, an estimate of snow depth. Um, people can also try to do it with passive microwave data. It's a bit ambiguous, but there's some uh, decent results I think coming out of this. And then there's people that try to just take atmospheric reanalysis fields, which are retrospective forms of numerical modeling of atmospheric conditions, and then put those into a sophisticated model to assimilate like basically how much snow is precipitating onto the sea ice as the ice is moving around the Arctic Ocean and then try to get an estimate of snow depth. But they give very different results. So you think a good job during the mass of the sea ice. So this is gonna lead me to the Mosaic Expedition, which I participated on in, um, why well, I actually joined the ship in uh, 2019. I don't know if you've heard about it, but it was the largest polar expedition so far in history with over 600 scientists that were involved. And the UK government funded six proposals allowing for one PI to have a two month burst space because it was quite pricey to go on the ship. It was about 100,000 euros per person for a two month um, burst space. So the UK government decided to, to fund six proposals, which was great. Um, but what was really nice with this, the whole idea was it, that scientists would come on for like two months blocks of time and we would make each other's measurements. So I would be collecting my data that I would cared about, but I'd also be making other people's measurements because when I would leave, somebody else would come and take over for me. And this idea was to really just have a year long observation of many different things that the scientists were interested in and sharing all this data amongst each other. So I was very fortunate to, uh, to participate. And through my, my Canada chair position, I was able to build a brand new radar that I then deployed um, on the expedition. And I call this a KUKA radar because it has two frequencies, Ka and Ku band. Um, it's fully polarimetric, which means that we can measure energy and vertical or horizontal polarizations. If you've ever had like polarized lenses um, in your eyeglasses, you'll know what that means. Um, so we can measure, if we send down a horizontally polarized beam, we can measure it coming back horizontally or vertically, similarly with vertical polarizations. Uh, and so it was the first of its kind sort of dual frequency radar. And really what we wanted to do was better understand how the snow properties that get modified from when snow first falls on sea ice to when you have the winter period to when melt starts, how this would influence basically where the radar is coming from. Because ideally I'd like to do a better job of being able to measure how thick sea ice is and look at those changes over time. And the European Space Agency is considering a mission right now, blending these two uh, frequencies into one satellite mission. So our data was also then gonna help um, maybe inform that mission, how well this would work. So the concept though with um, remote sensing at um, the Mosaic ice flow was really that there was gonna be many different instruments deployed and we would all be looking at the exact same snow and ice type. 
And all the instruments that were deployed were similar to what's on satellite. So we had passive microwave sensors, we had active microwave sensors, and we all had pretty much the same goal. We're all, we're all interested in improving our algorithms so we can do a better job of satellite observations. Um, so we deployed our radar at this remote sensing site where all the other ones were deployed, and we took our instrument on a sled and towed it uh, once a week um, along fixed transects so we could look at more spatial variability as well. Um, and just before I get into um, some of the measurements, we obviously, because again, I'm measuring just energy return, it doesn't tell me anything <laughs> without supplementary data. So when we made our transects, for example, and I want to look at maybe the possibility of combining Ka and Ku band to measure how thick or how thick it is. For example, so we would walk these transects with our radar, and people would be making snow depth and ice thickness measurements along the transect. Also, digging some snow pits to tell us about the density stir, if there's salinity in the snowpack, what the temperature was, things like that. Um, also, at the remote sensing site, there was really detailed um, snow pits done where they're actually doing micro CT scans. You could look at, for example, the crystal structure of the snow, which also, of course, influences the energy that we um, are measuring. And we had helicopter terrestrial laser scans to get estimates of the surface roughness. So all of this supplemental data was made by different teams with different research objectives, um, but all of this was shared um, with everybody so that we can do a better job with our data interpretation. So I thought I would just start with an, just showing what it was like just getting out. We we left Norway at the end of November 2019, and within you know a day, we're already in the, in the sea ice. And we had a Russian ship that was chartered to have us meet up with the German ship that was already frozen into the ice. Um, so we were quickly in polar ice. As soon as we, reached, we were basically in permanent darkness, and uh, it took us only about a week actually to get to uh, the German ship. We arrived around. December 13th. But uh, while it was pretty easy to get there, um, on the way back, it was much more difficult because as you'll see here, the ship is backing up to ram the sea ice. The ship wasn't super strong to deal with very thick winter ice. And so um, sometimes, you know, you'd be moving very, very slowly because as you can see, the ice is getting a bit thicker. The ship can't really push its way through the ice so much. So it did a lot of this. And on the way back out, it took us a week to get there. And when we left in March, it took us uh, a month to get out of the ice because we ran out of fuel and the ice was quite thick. But then we arrived at the, the camp on the December 13th. This is the Russian ship that we came in on. And this was a German ship that was already frozen into the ice. And it was, of course, very exciting for everybody to, to finally arrive and, and know that this was going to be our home which was supposed to be two months, but COVID things like that changed it a bit. Um, and just to give you a sense, I mean, it's such a huge logistic uh, campaign. So for example, we had a ship here. Um, this is where Polar Storm was. We had a runway that was built so we could do aircraft um, support and flights if we needed to do any emergency evacuations. Also, that's how we were gonna do an exchange, but then COVID happened. Um, and then we had this logistics area where we had all of our skidoos and all of our equipments put out. And then we had different camps. So, um, for example, there was Met City, which had all of your meteorological variables that were being collected. We had Remote Sensing City, where all the remote sensing instruments were. We had Ocean City, where they would be deploying big CTDs and other oceanographic observations. We had the um, ROV tent, which is where we deployed an underwater robot, robotic vehicle to measure the underside of the ice and also look at um, biological activity in the ocean. Um, biogeochemical people had their own site set up. So there's a huge um, camp. And then we had snow pits. The idea was that these snow pits would be around the uh, mosaic flow to get representative areas of where well, the snow is changing that we could all then use to interpret our data. And then we had regions where we do our transects. So we had a transect up in this region and we had a transect down in this region where we towed the radar. So that kind of gives you an idea of the setup of where we were.
And that's basically what we did every day was put our gear in a, in a little sled and walk out to our camp. You might have noticed this guy here had carried a rifle. Um, anytime you were on the sea ice, you had to carry a rifle for, for polar bears. So we always had a rifle with us. Sometimes the weather was a bit uh, not so nice to work in. Um, typically it was around minus 30 to minus 40 degrees. Uh, every once in a while we'd have really intense storms come by that redistributed the snow um, and made working outside a lot more, more challenging. But we weren't usually outside longer than two hours at a time before we'd come in for a bit because the polar bear guards are just standing there and they really get quite cold, especially in conditions like that. So it's really not fair to have them be outside too long. Um, when we got to uh, the ship, none of the remote sensing instruments were turned on because they had a breakup event. The ice is quite dynamic and all of a sudden, big open water areas formed and they had to pull everything off closer to the to a hut that we had because they didn't want to lose everything into the Arctic Ocean. So when we arrived, there was nothing turned on and we had to wait pretty much for the ship to leave again because we were worried with the ship leaving that it might break up the ice a bit more. So we didn't want to risk um, mounting everything and get everything back online until uh, the ship had gone. Um, so yeah, we spent a bit of time trying to <laughs> get all of the equipment ready. Everything was frozen. Lots of cables were frozen and trying to get everything back online and uh, yeah, pushing it all into position. It was, it was cold work. As you can see, everything is very frosty at this time of year. And then eventually we had everything back online about 10 days after we arrived. So December 23rd, we had our instruments on. This instrument right here is very similar to the satellite data that is measuring the spatial extent of sea ice. So this is a SSMI-like instrument that we brought. Um, this one's at operating at much lower frequencies. It's also a passive instrument. This was my activator instrument. There's another active instrument, but at a different uh, frequency. Just gives you a sense of, of what it looked like at our camp. And this is my radar making its measurements. So when we had it at the remote sensing city, we had it scan across um, incidence angles and we had it scan also um, azimuthally because you want to kind of get an average of what the energy is over a specified area. So that's kind of how my, my instrument looked when it was scanning. And this just gives you a sense of like what the data looks like. And this is why of course you need all the supplemental data because we're measuring energy being returned in units of decibels. And this is just for um, every hour, because we would scan once an hour on Christmas day. And this top one is the Ka band, which to remind you that's the assumption is that this might just be coming from the top of the snow surface. And this is the Ku band, which might be coming from somewhere within the snow. The assumption has been always from the ice. Um, and this just shows you the amount of energy returned. So the brighter colors means more energy is being returned. These are different color bars. So this is actually more energy at Ka band than Ku band. But the strongest return is looking straight down at Nader. Oops, sorry, go back for a second. This is Nader is at zero degrees, so looking straight down. And then as it scans out across the horizon, the amount of energy is reduced. Um, but you can kind of see some interesting features here. I think this is snow dunes probably a little bit. So it's, it's showing some surface undulation features. It's a bit smoother here in the KU band. So it's definitely penetrating through the snow, um, maybe hitting the ice, we don't really know. This is why we need supplemental data. Um, and this is just an example of just, we cared about you know, looking at snowpack properties, but the surface changes a lot too. And so this is just an example from a storm. We're making measurements every hour, but we had a storm come through around the 13th and you'll just start seeing that everything changes, the whole surface changes. And this is the kind of stuff that really challenges us in remote sensing because the instrument is gonna be very sensitive to not only what's happening within the snow, but also the surface roughness changes. And it's what makes interpretation of, of data so challenging when we're trying to understand what happened. Okay. But this was just an example of we, we had a storm um, and we can kind of just look at the evolution of, of the energy for the, the instrument is measuring during a storm. And basically during the storm period, the amount of energy increased. So we're getting more energy being returned. 
if we were to try to maybe make an ice thickness measurement from this, we would get a different value because of more energy being returned here than before the storm. What causes this? That's part of our research at the moment is trying to better understand, is it just a change in the surface topography that did this, or is it a change actually in the temperature of the snowpack? Because what happened is when the storm came, storms that come into the Arctic in winter are warm storms, relatively warm storms. So the air temperatures are a bit warmer, they're moist storms. And so the temperature of the snowpack went up quite a bit. So it could be due to a few different features. And this is what some of my postdocs is trying to better understand and characterize. Um, but then we also towed the trans, the Kukon transects, and this is the work I was interested in, as more understanding how well could we combine these two frequencies to get snow depth. That was basically the overall goal of, of making these transect measurements. So we would tow it with a skidoo, and um, it just could continuously um, collect data while we did that. Not in a scanning mode, it would just look straight down. Um, and then we would try to blend that with, with people that were collecting how Deep the snow was using a magnet probe, and you know it's, it's it's everything that you do is so tricky, right? Because we we have these snow depths along the transect, the northern and the southern. Actually, this is southern. This is northern. Um, but by the time, oops, by the time we would go make the our measurements, because we'd let them go first, the ice would have drifted, and so even just trying to match up where we are, even though we're on the same transect. Um, all of the data gets um, has to be corrected for ice drift because the ice is always moving during that time. So that's just showing an example of trying to fix the, the data to match. Um, this just gives you a sense from looking at helicopter laser scan what the northern transect looked like. Um, so we, obviously there was regions with really deep snow and more topography, but most of the stuff we were collecting was definitely over much smoother ice for the most part, which kind of made sense too because we couldn't really tell you with this um, ridges and rubbled ice that would be very challenging for us um, but we can look at things like how different the, the snow depths were and for the most part the northern transect which is this one was over second year ice so it had a bit deeper snow so maybe 24 centimeters on average this is just for January um, Whereas the southern transect was mostly newer ice, which had a much shallower snow depth. Um, not that that really matters so much, but for us, of course, in our interpretation, this does um, play a role. And you'll see that actually when you just look at this. So another way of presenting our data is looking at the power that's being returned from various heights of the instrument is above the snow surface. The snow surface is about here. So this is where we get um, the first big returns that are happening. But at Ka band, we're also seeing returns that are happening from deeper within the snow, and the northern transect had deeper snow. So you see more information at ranges further away from the sensor that are going into the snow. But in the southern transect, you had more shallower snow. So obviously, in here, um, a lot of it's more coming from the surface. Same thing at Ku band. Um, again, now you're seeing a bit deeper penetration, which does make sense with what we do think that it will go further within the snowpack. So there is some deeper penetration, but you can kind of already see that the maximum power that's being returned is really coming from the snow air interface. So even the assumptions that are currently made and using the like cryosat 2 to retrieve ice thickness is gonna be somewhat biased by that because there is a lot of energy coming from the surface. We can also look at cross polarization. So sending down a uh, horizontally polarized waveform and measuring the vertical um, waveform. Then it's a bit different. And this is, I think it's quite unique because we see there's a lot of power coming. What we believe now is actually the true snow ice interface. It's not at the surface anymore. And there's no satellite sensors right now using this combination. But this is something that I find really exciting about our data is that it could suggest that maybe doing a sensor or satellite sensor that is cross pull could give us more information than we're currently getting. And I'm just going to quickly run through this. I don't expect to do a lot of huge science like details of how we're doing our measurements, but um, just an example that if we take now the Ka band, which is supposed to be mostly coming from the surface of the snow, and we just try to find the first peak, the, the first peak in terms of energy being returned, and we can um, look at where that is. We can also look at the location where we see the deepest peak. So where did the second peak go, for example? 
Um, and we just try to find these surfaces, maybe just tracing out where the surface is, for example. So we definitely can see the snow ice interface and the deepest peak here in the black from the Ka is actually also pretty closely aligned to the snow surface. So we're not getting a, a lot of penetration. Sometimes we do. Um, but we can start looking at, well, if we just took those differences, how would it compare to snow depth that we were measuring with the, the magnet probe? And you know, we do see a correlation. So even with this one frequency, we could also maybe start getting an estimate of how deep the snow is on top of the ice. Similarly, at KU band, we have the same kind of thing. But now our deepest peak, oops, sorry. Oh, yeah, but now our deepest peak is actually now what we think is the actual snow and ice interface. So we kind of can do a better job tracing where that bottom surface is within hitting this, the ice surface. So we see a match now better. But again, as I mentioned, this, this HV combination, which is something that people haven't really been thinking about in terms of satellites yet, this is definitely, we think, giving us a snow ice interface, which is in this area. It's not giving us this peak. So if we take the peak from the horizontally or the vertically polarized energy and we compare that with the ice surface interface that we're getting, then we get a much better correlation. So we do see a better relationship with our snow depth. So this is kind of some of the work that we're exploring right now with the data that we collected um, during Mosaic. And I have a postdoc, Rosie Willett, who's working with me at UCL, who's going to be getting this hopefully published soon, because it is quite exciting and new. Um, and then one good thing that we did see, and this is just an evaluation over our winter season, but it just shows that um, our instrument was able to see even just the accumulation over time. So um, this is just average sampled snow depth along the different transects. So the south and the north transects, so blue for the south and north and the red. And then the stars are actually what was measured with the magnet probe. And we don't expect an exact match because we're not looking at the exact same snow. There's so much variability on, on really small spatial scales. And we can't drive exactly on the track for measuring the snow with the magnet probe. We get, at least even if they don't match, we get the seasonal accumulation quite, quite nicely between the two. So it's, there's some exciting new results for us that, that we're happy about. Um, the other thing that was very exciting is that in September 2020, when I wasn't on the ship, there was a rain on snow event that happened. And rain on snow is something that we expect to start happening, seeing happening more in the Arctic Ocean, um, when the Arctic as a whole just as the climate warms in general. But we've got to have an example where all the remote sensing instruments were deployed when this happened. So before it started to rain, there was new snow that happened a few days before this, but then it started, the surface started to change. It had a lot of hoarfrost and rime ice accumulating, but then it rained. Um, so you got a lot of rain on the snow. And then afterwards you got sort of needle snow and you got some glazing and snow crust. So there was strong modifications to the snowpack and all of our instruments were working at the time, which was good news. So we could actually look at its impacts. So we'll go back to passive microwave. Um, just for a moment, because this is what we're using to measure the total extent of sea ice, for example. And what we could see is that prior to rainfall, which is, this is rainfall, this is rainfall, and the gray area is temperatures above zero. So even if the temperature is above zero, you're gonna have a modification um, in the snow. And prior to that, the brightness temperatures were pretty stable. They weren't changing too much. We're looking at 19 gigahertz and 89. Um, they're pretty stable, but once it started to rain and the temperatures went above zero, they jumped up to um, a value that represents basically that the snowpack is melting. So they all went up to about 274 Kelvin. And then after things start to refreeze, they drop down again quite quickly at 89 because 89 is very sensitive to the surface. It took a bit longer at 19 gigahertz for the snowpack to dry out from the liquid water accumulation. So it took a bit longer. But the key thing that we saw is that there's also there's a permanent modification now. So the, the difference between horizontal and vertical is reduced now with it at 89 gigahertz, and it's actually increased at 19 gigahertz. These differences would actually bias our retrievals of how much sea ice is on that specific location if we did this um, with satellite data. So it actually is telling us that, you know, these events are, are actually really important to be able to capture because it will change how we observe the sea ice cover. 
And same thing with looking at the radar waveforms. I know this is a very complicated plot, but basically things were again quite stable in terms of the energy being returned until this rain on snow event happened. And then all of a sudden you're losing a lot of the power because now you've got liquid water in the snowpack and that just absorbs all the energy. And so we get very little return happening during the event. And then afterwards, it looks like we have an increase a bit in the range resolution. So that means that the energy might now be coming more from towards the top of the snow when we've had these ice layers form within the snowpack. And we've been really interested in how it changes the shape of the waveform peak, because this is what is used in retrievals of ice thickness from satellites like Cryosat 2. And I know it's a bit complicated to explain, so I'm not going to go into detail so much, but I will show a Cryosat 2 track. So peakiness is a, is a sense of how, how sharp that waveform is. So if we go back here, there's a sense about well, how, how sharp is that leading edge? And that's our peakiness. Um, and we can tell that this is all before the rain on snow event happened. This is when the rain on snow event happened. This is sort of the word location of where we had the ship. Cryosat 2 couldn't see the ship, so we can't be exactly over it, but we know that this rain on snow event covered a much larger area. And we can see that when it happened, there was a large increase in the pulse peakiness, large increase in, in the radar backscatter that was being measured. And so there was, you can see the event happened in the satellite data. But the interesting thing for me is how it persists afterwards. We don't really go back to these very low values in peakiness, for example. And because of the peakiness helps to go into the retrieval of ice thickness, you would bias your ice thickness retrievals. So this is a this is a new kind of satellite um, evaluations that we're doing that help could maybe help inform us and do a better job with these data. So now I'm just going to talk about the future um, in my last few minutes here. Um, you know, when we talk about trying to limit our warming in the Arctic or globally to one and a half or two degrees, um, the Arctic is so large, as we said, is you know it's about three times larger at the moment. But if I look at um, different emission scenarios, so um, this is going to be uh, the 585 under 1.5 degrees, and this is it under two degrees, and looking at different emission scenarios. So these are what's going into like the CMIP-6 models. Um, this is basically business as usual. This is us trying to really reduce <laughs> our CO2 emissions. It doesn't really matter at this point after two degrees too, too much. But you know, you're looking at Arctic warming, maybe in the Arctic in the summertime, you don't warm that much because most of the energy is going into melting the ice. You're not really raising the temperature so much. So maybe between one to two degrees. But you look here now in the autumn season, and especially under two degrees, you're looking at a warming about eight degrees in November, um, even in December, it's, it's quite high. So this kind of warming is what we talk about with Arctic amplification. And it is largely linked to the fact that you've lost the sea ice cover, sorry. Um, my computer's too sensitive. Um, so yeah, these are these are big changes in, in temperatures. I mean, we can't even imagine having such a large temperature increase um, where we live locally. So that's our warming we're looking at. And of course, as we look at this, and I can look at the relationship between sea ice area, this is in September again, and the surface temperature change, we can see this is the observations here. So we're already, even though climate models are doing a better job than they did in the last couple IPCC reports in terms of representing the historical observations of sea ice, we're still a bit on the extreme end uh, in terms of how quickly the ice is declining. But basically, if we want to say when is the Arctic Ocean going to be ice free, and we usually say about a million square kilometers, because that does mean most of the Arctic Ocean has no ice. There might be some ice north of Greenland and within the Canadian archipelago, but most of the Arctic Ocean will have no ice. And that's going to happen at a temperature of about, well, you can kind of try to extrapolate here, but maybe about 1.7 degrees with all the climate model estimates, it's going to happen around here. So you know, maybe you can limit your warming to 1.5. Even then you might still get some instances of ice-free summers happening because you can see even on here that at 1.5, there are model runs that do already go ice-free in the summer. So yeah, this is the future we're looking at. Um, and it's not just that we're talking about the summer ice disappearing, depending on how much more CO2 we add. So I'm just changing the plot now because we can, 
is we can represent this relationship between ice and temperature. We can also do it between how much more CO2 we add to the atmosphere, which I think in terms of policy to me is a bit more relevant because it tells us what are our limits on how much CO2 we can keep adding to the atmosphere. But basically this is where we are with another 800 or so um, gigatons of carbon added, we'll start seeing ice free in September. But you go to a thousand, you go and move further out. And this is where we are right now in 2050 with the current estimates in terms of greenhouse gas emissions if we don't do anything. Then you're looking at like three months already ice free. And you can start extending into the winter time as well if we just keep adding more carbon to the atmosphere. And you know, at the moment we are adding about 35 gigatons of carbon every year to the atmosphere. So it can give you sort of this timeline of, of how quickly this transformation is going to happen. And I, I do think in our lifetimes, this is the reality that we're going to experience in the Arctic Ocean. So we can also look at what the climate models are suggesting to us in terms of you know, how long we're going to have open water in the Arctic. Um, again, this is, this is broken down by emission scenario. So trying to reduce greenhouse gases dramatically versus not doing anything really. Um, and looking at just the first year that the any region is going to be ice free for 90 days, 180 days, or 270 days. So already, you know, if we look at limiting our um, warming and, and our greenhouse gas emissions and the warming, then we could see that, well, the Arctic Ocean is not going to likely go ice free entirely. I mean, it, it might around 2080, but it's not going to do it so quickly. Um, but of course, a lot of the marginal seas, this has already happened. I mean, the blues are already happened um, 2020. So this is kind of where we are at the moment with large parts of the Arctic already 90 days ice free. But, you know, if we want to have 180 days of ice free, that won't happen probably until um, around the end of the century. But again, as, as you change your emission scenario, the year at which this is going to happen is coming a lot closer now. So now we're looking around 2040 as to when you might have 90 days of ice free conditions in the Arctic Ocean. And of course, all of this matters a lot to um, the development of the region because a lot of countries in the Arctic Ocean, most of it's on the Russian side, and most of it is owned by Russia. But there's a lot of resources to be extracted from the Arctic Ocean, not just in terms of hydrocarbons, also fisheries that we don't know enough about. Um, obviously, the use of a northern sea route as a way to transport goods between China and, and Europe, that is already being done quite a bit. So we can kind of look at these projections. Um, finally, we can also look at it in climate sensitivity instead of looking at the year. So, you know, at what temperature, what global temperature do we actually start to see um, the Arctic Ocean becoming 90 days or 180 or 270 days um, ice free? So, I mean, basically, we're kind of seeing that, yeah, if we hit five degrees up in the Arctic, which is realistic at this point, then you're gonna have ice free for most of the year. The other thing that um, another one of my postdocs just recently published on in Nature was um, looking at how the precipitation is gonna change in the Arctic and comparing it to the previous assessments using the CMIP-5 models, but now working with CMIP-6 models. And as, as the Arctic continues to warm, we precipitation has been forecasted to increase. So this isn't really so new in terms of what we've already known from other modeling studies, but it's going to start transitioning faster to rainfall than we saw before in um, the previous stuff. And especially, I mean, October, the, the, the autumn season is definitely the period where we get the most increase, for example, in precipitation. And a lot of this now is dominated by rainfall. So the green is all the rainfall that's going to be coming um, and then snow cover is going to decline at least September, October, November. Um, in the wintertime, snowfall doesn't change too much. It still goes up somewhat, which is, I guess, good. So total precipitation is going to be going up still in the winter. But you can kind of see the green line emerging. So a little bit more rainfall even at the end of the century that will be happening as we start to transition to this warmer climate. And the striking thing is like the decade as to which we expect this transition to go from more snow to now more rain is a couple decades, one to two decades earlier um, under the latest climate model simulations. Now, of course, we can question the accuracy of these climate model simulations, but that's the current estimates at the moment. So especially here in the autumn, so I'm showing the autumn season. So this is what the 
This team of six models do in terms of a decade as to when you become rainfall dominated. This was it under CMIP5. And then this is a difference. And so you can see large parts of the Arctic Ocean are also gonna have this transformation now to more rainfall. Um, and then also here, a lot of it over Siberia and also the Canadian Arctic. And this has a lot of implications for um, climate processes in these regions and ecological systems as well. Um, and so, you know, when I think about this a lot, I'm thinking about what are all these implications from this? And of course, there's so many implications from, you know, how people utilize the Arctic and especially indigenous communities that depend on the ice to hunt and to travel on the ice, to food security, to extreme weather events, to um, increase risks from even oil spills and things like that because the Arctic Ocean is opening up. And this is a Churchill port in um, Hudson Bay. This port's gonna try to get used a lot more. And these all have a lot of implications for climate as a whole. And the reality is, is that what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay there. It's going to translate to everything else on the planet because it's not acting alone in isolation. So there's a lot of um, concern about this and how do we plan for adaptation and resilience? Because I think no matter what happens, this is a future that we're looking at at the moment and we need to be able to prepare governments and communities for these changes. And I don't know how long that was, but that was my <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Julian. <laughs> that was great. Um, really interesting. Um, <clears throat> let me start with a, one quick question. You're talking about the, the climate model um, projections. How, how adequately do you think the climate models are, are taking this loss of sea ice into account these days? Are they really picking up the, the feedback effects of the, of the, uh, the loss of ice? Or, you know, they're doing better. So I would say so in, in 2007, when I published the first paper with looking at the CMIP3 models, they were doing really poorly. We were probably two to three decades ahead of what the models were saying, even with the worst case scenarios. So they were very conservative. And then um, it's gotten better, six years better than the other modeling efforts that have gone into the IPCC reports have done. But it's still conservative overall. I would yeah. still say the pace of ice loss that we're seeing is still faster than many of the models can capture. Um, and, and part of it is also the way that the models represent ocean processes. We're realizing now I have another student who she's been looking at the ocean system and where the heat goes when you have ice melt and fresh water into the ocean, the models aren't getting that. And so I think there's definitely biases that influence this. So our models are not actually modeling the ice formation. They do. Correct. They do. Okay. They do. Yeah. No, they're fully coupled models. It's just obviously, um, I mean, everything is parameterized, and so the more, the better we can parameterize certain processes and know which ones are the most important. And also, it's the resolution in part because I think with some of the climate models, in terms of the ocean resolution and the upper ocean processes and how much heat is retained, because as the as the Arctic Ocean melts. Um, and oh, the mixed layer gains a lot of that heat in summer, where that heat gets entrained, some of it gets released to the atmosphere, but some of mm -hmm. it may stay in the ocean and get pushed down deeper and yeah. make it back up to the surface to melt the ice. Okay, yeah, thanks. Jackie, I think. Um, yes, gonna... fantastic. Thank you so much, Julian, it was brilliant. Very technical, but I loved it. Um, <laughs> so I have, but to sort of broaden out for our, for our sort of uh, participants, um, who are students and uh, they, they may not have quite as much uh, technical background. Um, I kind of want to contrast some of the stories we hear from Greenland, where we have um, really heartrending stories where, you know, people going out onto the ice and they're experiencing 26 degrees centigrade, you know, in the summer and the whole surface is melting, right? Yeah. And then, you know, I've been out on the sea ice, I've been out on flows, not quite as extreme. But the one thing I was really curious about is the the change obviously in the albedo, and maybe you might just say just a little bit about that. Yep. But also um, there was quite a lot of work done by groups using submarines and doing surface work on these chimneys that were formed and, and were speculated to have a lot to say about uh, transporting or transferring heat sort of through and up and down. And I'm just wondering, I mean, is your view that those kinds of structures within the ice now the sort of down into the ocean, do you see them just disappearing or, or you know, because there, there, there are other structures besides what's happening on the surface. So I'm kind of interested on the on the below the surface structures, whether you've sort of had any thoughts about that as well. 
Yeah, so I guess I'm, I'm a bit confused as what do you mean by chimneys? You mean heat coming from the mantle going through the ocean up or? No, no, no. These were called by people at the, at the, um, at the Polar Institute and also by Bass, but basically at the Polar Institute. Um, they were formations within the ice, within the sea ice. Oh. They were fairly ephemeral, but they were detected from submarines. Okay. Um, so I was just curious whether you sort of ever come across them. Not, not to worry oh. if you haven't. Peter Wadhams did a lot of work on them and, and mm. measured them quite successfully. So, yeah, no, I guess I am not actually aware of the chimneys. I mean, I do, I'm aware of the submarine data because we've done comparisons with the satellite observations and the submarine thickness observations. And, and that's yeah. one way to reconstruct, you know. Better. I that was my second question was how, how good are the data relative to the submarine data and sort of looking that way as opposed to looking this way? Yeah, I would say I would trust the sonar um, measurements from submarine more than what's currently produced from satellite at right. the moment. Right. And it really right. is because of the snow. We don't know enough about the snow. And, and you cannot mm -hmm. retrieve ice thickness using laser altimetry or radar altimetry without knowing the snow cover. And that is right. a big bias at the moment. And um, so a lot of research is going into that, and which is why I was really curious if we could combine KA and KU band to get snow depth. Because if we can yeah. do that, then that's great. Then we can maybe retrieve ice thickness and snow depth at the same time. And you know, snow, snow of course has implications, not just for measuring how thick the ice is, all the light that comes through the sea ice stops if there's snow on the ice. You basically can't penetrate much depending on how yeah. much snow is on the ice. And obviously the light penetration through the ice governs when the phytoplankton and the under ice algae bloom, which feeds the entire marine ecosystem. So right. we need to know how so much snow is on the ice. The ice thickness is less important actually for light penetration, it's really the snow. Okay, that's fantastic. Anyway, I, as I say, I have this image of, of the sort of various hunters out on the ice, just literally standing in pools of blue water as it's all just melting underneath them. Yeah, so, I know there were some yeah. really striking pictures from Greenland recently of that. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, you know... Anyway, thank you. <laughs> I, I will just add an aside. I was, um, I was on a panel recently with Arctic Net, and um, there was an Indigenous person on our panel. And she was saying that the plants don't rely on traditional anymore. And they're trying to assimilate information that's coming out of weather prediction models or other science stuff to, to know if it's safe for them to go out anymore because their traditional ways of knowledge about weather in the Arctic and about the safety of the ice, it doesn't work anymore. And they do have many accidents and people falling through the ice because mm. things are just changing so fast for them. Thanks. Ida, you had a mm -hmm. question. So I might have misheard you, but in the beginning, I thought you said that over the last decade or so that the ice has stabilized in that it's, region. Well, I would say that the total sea ice extent isn't really dropping. It's it's kind of like we had a stepwise change where we're kind of hovering around 4 million when we used to have about 8 million square kilometers right. at the end of summer. And we've kind of been staying in the same boat. I would argue that there's a couple things happening. So one is that um, when you have a lot of open water, of course you're going to form ice again once the temperatures get cold enough, and the atmosphere and the oceans release all of its heat back to the atmosphere. And so you actually grow ice quite vigorously in that sense. So if you have thin ice, it grows much faster than thick ice. So once the ice gets about one and a half meters thick, it doesn't really grow much anymore. I mean, it's very slow thermodynamic ice growth. So you have a delay in the ice formation, and then you also have a delay then in the snow cover that's accumulating on the ice. So if you don't have snow and you have a delay in the ice and you have thinner ice, you're gonna grow a lot of ice. So I think at the moment we're still growing thermodynamically enough ice to sort of keep us at where we're at at the moment. Do you think, so it seems like at some point we, when it went from the 8 million to 4 million, we hit some kind of tipping point. Is there an assumed tipping point coming again? So we've kind of stabilized relatively. Do you, do you expect, I know this is a guess, but do, would you expect another tipping point to be on the horizon? Yeah, what I would expect, so there could be two things I could do it. One could just be an unusual summer, which had either unusual temperatures that really melted a lot of ice that summer, or um, maybe like a big storm, it just, broke up all the ice and got it to melt out quickly. Cause then you bring a lot of heat from the ocean up as well. If you have a really big storm like the 2012 cyclone, for example. Um, the other thing I think could happen is that 
as the Arctic keeps warming and especially wintertime temperatures warming you, and you shorten the ice growth season to the point where you're actually starting to really impact how much is grown every winter, then I think you can get to that vulnerability point where the next big hit will happen. Because one of the things that is changing is, is a lot of the um, winter ice had been going away also um, less, less steep as the summer ice, but it really had been going away a lot in the Barents Sea sector, which is a Norwegian kind of sector. And that was largely due to a lot of ocean Atlantic heat water coming up. Now that seems to have slowed down again. And that's related to much longer timescales of ocean circulation on the global ocean. And so if that heat is going, it's, it's not putting as much heat up north anymore. So some of the winter ice is kind of coming back in that region. Okay. Do we understand that cycle enough to know whether it's, you know, um, going to come back, for example, or no? No, I mean, I think it, it has time scales of like 60 years, something yeah, yeah. like that. So that, that's a much bigger right. fluctuation in the ocean circulation patterns. But um, yeah, I mean, obviously, if you have more ocean heat coming in, that's also going to hammer it. So a lot of the climate models, when they did these sort of rapid ice loss events, where all of a sudden you lost most of the ice cover very quickly, that had to do with ocean heat content. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, we don't have any questions coming from the, uh, the other participants and, and the audience. Uh, so, unless uh, Jackie, you or Ida have anything more, or Juan or Ying, do you guys have any questions? I guess not. <laughs> yeah, sorry if it was a bit technical. I was trying to not be too technical, but I mean, the innovations that we need to be doing is to really better understand. Because the, the thing is, with, with satellite data, we're never measuring what we're trying to measure. We yeah. have these yeah. algorithms that we apply to the data. Um, but I think to really advance the science and do a better job at observing, we have to start um, getting more physically based models. Well, you mentioned mentioned drones at some point, and there's been a lot more, you know, a lot of development in that in that area. Is that is that um, something? Is that a technology that could could help help improve um, some of the measurements? Yeah, and we not, and not necessarily we are... not necessarily airborne, but maybe uh, marine drones as well. You're saying that the submarines are, are doing better. Get, be get better data than the, than the satellites. So is that, is yeah, that a way? Well, we're actually working on some aircraft drone stuff at the moment. Um, running a radar is a bit more difficult with the power requirements, but we are working with some people in the US that are designing a system that we could probably fly on a drone. Mm -hmm. And I'm also interested in, um, I've always been still interested in optical data because that's what I did my PhD on. But um, we're trying to develop a drone system that has a hyperspectral remote sensing instrument on it, which people have already flown those, but at the same time have a robotic arm that could take a sample of the snow and ice. Mm. Because sometimes when you're in the Arctic, you see these areas of really dirty black ice. And, you know, what is it? Is it sediment from the land? Is it carbon from all the forest fires? Because there's a lot more fires happening up in the Arctic as well these days. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what is, or is it a biological activity and being able to get the spectral information together with a sample of the ice right. would be ideal. And often when you're on a ship, especially in the summertime, you don't always get to sample the ice because it's going to be unstable to go on. Yeah. Um, yeah. And maybe the ship won't stop because they're not going there. So we want to be able to fly something off of a ship that we could sample some of this ice. That sounds cool. Jackie, did you have a follow up? Yes, I did. It was it was just really a sort of a, more of a concluding one, which is you were showing that the gradual uh, changeover of different missions and different satellite platforms and so on. Um, and I know that when I was in the Easter Advisory Board, we uh, we really really talked about, uh, of course, Cryosat and then its whole evolution. And then there was a very long discussion around polar missions. Um, but are you hopeful that we're going to be able to get the kinds of missions that you think we need? I think that's really my question. I'm, I'm a bit concerned right now about the passive microwave data record because the US, mm -hmm. the, the well, basically the Senate had voted down to continue the program, even though they even still had a sensor built that was stored in a, you know, a clean room. They, they had the Air Force dismantle it because they decided not to support the program anymore. Now, the Chinese do have a satellite up at the moment, but the US can't work with any of that data. I think Europe might be able to. Um, so really, we're looking to ESA to be launching the next sort of passive microwave sensor that could continue these observations. Because once these satellites die, and you never know when that's going to happen, 
then we're going to be in the dark. And that's literally uh, and metaphorically. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So it's a big, it's a big worry. Um, yeah, and I know right now Issa is also going to consider this dual frequency, like Christ yes. to follow on. Um, so I think it could be quite exciting. And if it overlaps with NASA's ISAT 2 mission, that'll be really great as well. But it takes time for these missions, so. No, I, but they're getting shorter and shorter in terms of uh, from, from science mission review, evaluation, to, yeah. to getting them up there. So, but we'll keep our fingers crossed anyway on that one. Yeah. And, uh, but I think you've, you've shown what a huge and tremendous um, step up continuously having such a long archive of data. It really, you know, it really helps. And then when you put something on the ice pack itself, you can really add so much mm -hmm. to it. So thank you very much. It was brilliant from Microsoft. Thank you. Yeah. And I guess we can, we can end it there. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you, guys. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Julian. Yes, those of us who can, we will clap for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. All right. Enjoy the snow. Enjoy the snow yeah. in the Alps. <laughs> I wish it would snow. It hasn't snowed now for like... Well, it's been, it's been a while. It's got a high pressure over us and we're not getting any snow. It's mm. quite it's quite disappointing. <laughs> well, I think your dog is waiting very patiently for you behind you. I know. And, she really and, wants and, to go out. I think she needs to go out. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks. Bye.